corrupted. Burn the box. Um, about 5,000 5, years ago, humanity discovered that basically you could force people to work. Uh, so we went from the tribal environment to city-states, and the reason people worked and created a surplus was really because of coercion, slavery, serfdom, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And as much as we may dislike this uh, revolution in human productivity, a lot of things that we have called civilization are related to this uh, jump, right? So basically, negative, extrinsic motivation was the key driver of human productivity for, for a long time. I think if capitalism has a, uh, the bright side, if you like, is that we discovered about 500 years ago that we could change extrinsic negative uh, motivation by extrinsic positive motivation. In other words, build a system where people exchange value, uh, exchange equal value with each other, operate in a marketplace, and again, it has a lot of drawbacks and negative sides, but I don't think we can deny that it did uh, create uh, a really important jump in uh, human productivity. And again, lots of the things that we enjoy today are, are related to that big change. I think about 40 years ago, uh, we started a, a third step of uh, revolution in human productivity, and it's basically we discovered that we can work with intrinsic positive motivation. And uh, as Walla was saying about you know, when we jumped in the internet in the, in the early 90s, uh, so basically, what I would argue that this new technology is doing for us, it allows the self-aggregation of individuals around the creation of common value. And the nice thing about the tribal age was, you know, fairly egalitarian social structures, everybody knew each other, but the tragedy was if somebody else got bigger than you, you got defeated. And basically the whole history of humankind is small defeated by big. Now what if we can uh, aggregate small group dynamics on a world scale? What if instead of a multinational making an encyclopedia in a command and control fashion, we have people from all the world aggregating together and creating, for example, Wikipedia or the Linux operating system? This is something I call peak hierarchy. Uh, and I think this is the age we're living in. We have discovered a new way of working. Now, just as a comparison, if you have a peer-producing project, 100% of the people are passionately motivated. A recent study in the US showed in a corporation, only one person out of five is passionately motivated. So four out of five people are working there only because of the compensation you give them. There's no intrinsic motivation, right? All right, so next slide, please. Um, so my claim is that if you have on the one si side a proprietary company protecting its IP, having to pay everybody, and it is faced with a competition from an open community linked to a set of entrepreneurs, I call the entrepreneurial coalition, that eventually the for-profit entity will lose, will lose its competitive uh, endeavor with, with a new en entrant. And of course, that's what we see with open source software. And I think one of the reasons is that a proprietary company has some shackles. It only innovates relatively, right? You have to be better than the competition. Once an open community takes uh, place and starts working on open source software or an open design project, it strives for absolute quality, right? You're not just making a better fridge. You want to make the best possible fridge that you can make. So in the beginning, it may be chaotic, but over time what we see is that these communities actually do create very robust um, uh, pro uh, products. Okay, the second law of asymmetric competition, not yet, not yet. The second law of asymmetric competition says basically if you have one company competing with another uh, and one opens up, it will get stronger than the one that stays closed. And the third law is basically saying that if two open communities facing each other, let's say Drupal versus Joomla, for example, and one successfully allies itself in an entrepreneurial coalition, it will become stronger. So that gives us then, uh, next slide please, the, the situation where we get hybrid economies, where we get combinations of communities with 
uh, corporate entities making uh, something new. Now, this is a, a view of business models where you see uh, paid versus free and open versus closed, right? What we have known until today is basically paid and closed, the Microsoft model. You pay people to innovate, you protect the IP, uh, and you sell it. What Chris Anderson talks about is basically closed and free. You still have closed IP, but because the transaction costs are so low now in, in, in electronic distribution, you give the main thing for free, and you build derivative value around uh, your free offerings. A lot of you know, the free economy of Chris Anderson falls in that uh, quarter. The open source model is on the top uh, left where you have uh, paid but open. So you open up the code, but you get paid for development, integration, training, et cetera, et cetera. You build a business practice around the derivative value, but it, uh, you have a commons of knowledge, code, and design, right? The fourth, uh, which is also growing very fast now, I guess we could call the share economy. Think about couch surfing, right? You're young today. Um, and you don't have a lot of money, well, you still travel, right? And you go to couch surfing to find people who willingly share their couches and rooms because they're interested in, in, in meeting foreign uh, visitors. So, of course, my, my claim is that the upper right corner is now in serious danger and is being replaced by more uh, business models that, that will fall into three different um, quarters. All right, so peer production, peer governance, peer property, we, we, the new modalities that are emerging out of this world uh, have uh, basically created uh, three new models. Uh, I think we should distinguish them because they have different dynamics. One is the commons model, uh, where people actually create something in common, where it's Linux or Wikipedia. Because they create something in common, they create strong ties to each other and they create their own infrastructure. This is why in this model we have what we call the Floss Foundation. Uh, we can call them four benefit associates which manage the infrastructure for cooperation and which are a kind of derivative of the open uh, community. The second model is what you know on the, uh, YouTube, Flickr, etc., which is a sharing model. What is the difference? The difference is people aggregate because of their own expression. They want to share their own expressions. Therefore, they have weak links with each other, do not succeed in creating their own platforms, and they need third-party platforms, which are the corporate platforms that we know, right? And the third one is uh, crowdsourcing. Now, my vision is the following, and this is the, what the slide here is saying, is that this model, which we already know works in the immaterial field, is moving toward the fields of material production. And I just want to stress the fact that when this starts happening, Think about the Arduino uh, circuit boards uh, and uh, about a dozen open, car, open source cars projects that are emerging. That the communities that do that, they do two things. First of all, they design for sustainability, right? So you take eCars, which is a, a really interesting project. I'll show the website in a minute. Uh, is basically creating a car in a modular fashion and the skin can be replaced every three years and it's biodegradable, right? So when an open design community takes possession, if you like, of a project, it doesn't design for planned obsolescence. So it's not just a good thing for creativity, innovation, it's actually a key development for sustainability as well. And so the model that we see emerging is basically the following. So the, the first layer uh, is a collaborative platform. The second uh, layer is the open design commons. Around that, you have an entrepreneurial coalition emerging. So this is the, the kind of new model that we see. All right, the next slide. Next. And the next. Uh, all right, so in industrial capitalism, if you like, the, the main tension was between capital and labor, right? Uh, and how we distribute uh, the benefits of industrial work. I think the, the new tension that we see today will be between communities and the corporate entities they work with, and how, how is power shared, power divided, etc. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is a, a slide I made. So what we do in the P2P Foundation is basically observing and monitoring open and free practices 
on the input side of peer production. If you don't have open and free raw material, you cannot work together in a free way. The second step is participatory inclusionary governance processes, and the third is commons-oriented output. So I, I want to make a little remark here. How, how do societies change? Uh, how do phase transitions occur? Well, if you look at the end of the Roman Empire, for example, or the transition from uh, feudalism to capitalism, uh, my vision is the following, is that people start, when they, when they face with the crisis of the system, they start developing new patterns. For example, monks saying the 15th century, well, maybe we can access the divine directly without, you know, without priests. Uh, another leader of the same period saying, well, maybe interest is not that bad. Another monk inventing double book accounting, right? So all these things start occurring separately, but eventually people start seeing the connection between different part parties, and they start forming a seed form of a new system within the old, right? So in other words, the serve-based system emerges within a dying uh, slave-based empire because both uh, slaves are becoming restless and some slave owners start morphing uh, their, their slavery uh, system to a serve-based system. Same thing happens at the end of the feudal era. So what I'm claiming is, and this is what the map is about, is that we are already now seeing the seeds of a new society within the old, and this is what I call open everything. So this is a kind of a vision of uh, the emerging open infrastructures of uh, a new society. Okay, first thing. There is a deep cultural change occurring. Um, very briefly, the Edelman Trust Barometer says that uh, in 2003, when you ask people who do you trust, 70% answered an institutional answer, the CAO, the doctor, the hospital. About 20% at that time said, I trust people like myself. Four years later, I believe 2006 or 2007, the same trust barometer see this declining to 28%. And the answer, I trust people like me, goes to 68, 70%, right? So this was not just in the West, this includes China. So this is a, really a sign of a very deep transformation in values that, that is occurring in the world today. Think about an explosion in, in, for example, yard sharing, bike sharing, car sharing. Uh, there's really uh, lots of things happening that show that there's a, a cultural transformation taking place. Okay, the, the next, please. Um, okay, what happened at the end of the Middle Ages was that the serfs started fleeing uh, their domains and started establishing this in the cities, right? And we see the emergence of three cities. These three cities obtain charters that defend a new set of rights within the feudal uh, society. So what we see today is that people start creating charters, like the GPL, the General Public License, or like the Creative Commons, which basically set a set of rules which says you can participate in this peer project if you abide by a set of principles, right? So the first thing we're doing in creating this open infrastructure is we are creating all these social charters which embed the new value system and create the norms, the cultural norms that govern these new projects. Um, okay, these are then enabled in the infrastructures. Remember the, the vision of uh, collaborative platforms, open design commons, entrepreneurial coalition. So we are now at the point where we start building those collaborative platforms. Um, next one. Uh, and the next one, and the next one. Uh, I just want to uh, show you this one and tell you a little anecdote. So Arduino sells about 50,000 circuit boards. They have open designs. And I, I met an Arduino uh, collaborator in Milan recently. He gave me an interesting story. So any company in the world can download the shared designs of Arduino and can physically produce those circuit boards, right? And a lot of Chinese companies are doing that without participating in the community. But because they don't do that, they lack a lot of the um, uh, embodied knowledge that comes from actually developing the circuit board. And therefore, their circuit boards are not so good. So what Arduino is experiencing is that people are actually ordering circuit boards with a Made in Italy uh, stamp on it because they want to buy the circuit boards by the people that are actually involved in developing them. OK, 
Okay, this is an example of uh, the social dynamics in Arduino. The next uh, slide shows the eCars project. Um, so they, they just, um, I think this is quite important. The first uh, successful project is finished. It's the eCarola. Uh, again, this is interesting because it shows a new model. With the eCarolla, any garage in the world can download the designs that show you how to transform a Corolla to a hybrid electric car. In theory, people can just bring their car to any garage in the world uh, on Monday evening, and on Monday morning they have an electric Corolla. Okay, I don't know how far they are in actually f in the physical implementation, but the design phase of the eCarolla is, is done and is uh, working uh, uh, quite well. Okay, the next. Um, so what we're doing at the P2P Foundation is basically monitoring and observing these trends. Uh, this is just one of our more popular pages. It's called Product Hacking. It has, a, has about 300 of these open distributed manufacturing uh, projects. And uh, next, please. And so you can see, uh, just in terms of transportation, what is happening already. So I have 24 projects, probably more, but just to give you an indication of the, the importance of these uh, projects. Next one. Uh, this is a uh, conference we held in Manchester in the beginning of November, and we brought together people from various open and distributed platforms. Uh, okay, I have to run now, so let's go to the next one. Um, okay, so we embed these platforms in new practices like open money and open hardware, open designs. Next. Uh, <laughs> yes, very quick. Uh, which we then apply in our own domains. Next. <laughs> uh, and this creates new products. Next. And uh, this is where people like us come in. So there's a lot of little movements emerging in the world. Uh, we try to accompany these changes, meshwork uh, these people together. Next. Uh, okay, just a brief mention. Uh, usually a new political movement starts with transgressive behavior, file sharing, and you go to jail. Then we start building our own infrastructures, Creative Commons, GPL, because we want to create our own rules. We still face the old world. So this is uh, like the Magna Carta, if you like, of the digital age. We did that in Barcelona uh, also in the beginning of the month. So I urge you to have a look at the FC forum, where we have a charter of rights that we claim are necessary for these open infrastructures to arise. Next, and this is the last one. Um, next. <laughs> All right, okay. So we are now moving to the policy field. We have the creation of a UN lobby around the commons um, and basically, I want, okay, a brief example, brief example, are we close already? All right, so taxing, carbon tax, government, right? Cap and trade, market, cap and dividend, a commons-oriented solution uh, where everybody has an equal right to a, a carbon uh, offset. And if you use more, you pay the people who use less. But it's not a market, and it's not the state. It's something new, and I think that's the innovation that uh, open infrastructures are about. Thank you.